Previously, she was the first director of research in data science at Vodafone globally, the first female scientific director at Telefonica, research and development, and research at Microsoft. She holds a degree in communications and engineering from UPM and a PhD in artificial intelligence from the Media Lab at NEET. Um, she has a very long list of honors and awards, and I would like to mention here today that she is a distinguished scientist and fellow. In 1916, she got the Spanish National Computer Science Award. In 2018, she was awarded Engineer of the Year by the Professional Association of Telecommunications Engineers in Spain. In the same year, she received an honorary doctorate from the University Miguel Hernández and the Medal for Business and Social Merit of the uh, Valencian government. And in 1919, uh, she got the European Data Scientist Award of the Year. So it's really, it's really an impressive uh, list and an impressive career. She has many patents, papers, and, and citations in different topics. Uh, some of the topics are human behavior, human computer interaction while computing with data. And finally, uh, she has been appointed a commissioner for the president of the Valencian Community on Artificial Intelligence and Data Science right to the fight against the COVID-19. And that's the reason why she's today with us. She's going to talk about uh, her work in, within this commission. And we are so glad to have you here. And this is such a big honor to have this brilliant mind in computer science and in artificial intelligence with us. So go ahead, Nuria, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for this long introduction. <laughs> uh, and thank you for the invitation and for making this possible. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to be talking about the work that we've been doing since March. Uh, on using data science to help fight against COVID-19. But of course, this is not something that I had done before, you know, or, or, I, or I was doing, you know, originally planned, you know, for my uh, work in, in 2020. Um, before March 3rd, actually, I was very involved with ELIS, well, I'm still am. Um, ELIS is the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligence Systems, and it's a, a nonprofit association created in Europe by um, the machine learning um, community, um, motivated by the fact that the top talent in machine learning in Europe is actually not working in Europe or is not working for a European institution. It's mainly working for American companies or for Asian companies. So Europe is struggling to retain and to attract and also to nurture the next generation of top talent in AI. At the same time, we know that AI is absolutely strategic and necessary. So we decided to create this association to change a little bit the way things are done in Europe and to create an environment that would enable the top talent to choose to stay in Europe or to come to Europe. So one of the actions that Ellis launched was the establishment of Ellis units. Ellis units are um, groups of um, scientists uh, that have a certain criterion of excellence and that also satisfy a number of conditions that make it really attractive in terms of the salaries and the freedom and the um, sort of like no teaching load, you know, ability to make startups, you know, sort of like all the barriers that exist right now, so try to remove them. So I applied for one of these ELIS units uh, to be created in Alicante with the support of the Valencian government. And it was uh, the proposals were all evaluated by independent uh, scientists, and like a committee that Ellis established. And it was one of the units that was uh, selected. So I'm in the process of creating this unit as a nonprofit foundation working on these three topics. And I'm just explaining this because I am right now hiring. The unit has right now only one person, which is me. So I need to actually hire top talent in these three topics, human behavior modeling from data using machine learning techniques, both individual behavior modeling and aggregate behavior modeling, Devel development of intelligent user interfaces and particularly intelligent mobile systems and personal assistance, and then addressing the existing challenge, challenges in um, AI sort of like or machine learning driven decision making systems such as algorithmic 
opacity, algorithmic discrimination, computational violations of privacy, subliminal manipulation of human behavior, or the lack of veracity. So that was what I was doing. And then, you know, COVID-19 happened, as you know, and Spain was actually one of the worst countries, the most affected countries at the time, you know, and I was seeing all these exponential growths and, you know, Spain being kind of like number one. And um, I had worked uh, uh, for the past 10 years on the topic of how to use big data and AI um, to sort of like what is called for social good, to help us, you know, improve the world in a way. And one of the areas that I had worked on was infectious diseases and pandemics. I did some work when I was director at Telefonica about the H1N1 flu outbreak. I, had, I did some work two summers ago on Ebola. I did, and I was actually doing at the time some work on malaria when you know this outbreak took place. So I felt that maybe an opportunity was being missed because I was seeing all this exponential growth. I was seeing this chaos and stress. And at the same time, it didn't seem that very valuable data was being leveraged and was being used to help better understand the situation and to help make better decisions. So I was actually sick in bed. Uh, I got some virus. I don't think it was coronavirus, but I was actually pretty sick. And I kind of like decided I had to do something. So I wrote an article for El País newspaper, um, sort of like pointing out to this missed opportunity and to the fact that we could be using, you know, big data. We could be using the data from the mobile network to understand human mobility, to make better epidemiological models, you know, and we weren't using it. And I also contacted with my old colleagues at Telefonica and Vodafone, and I contacted with some contacts that I had in the central government and in the Valencian government, because my idea was to create sort of like a task force of experts that very quickly, because we knew, you know, what, what to do, we could help, you know, better um, understand the situation and help make better decisions. So I was um, uh, quite, um, I guess, lucky because I got a very positive response from the Valencian government. And um, they said, yes, this is totally aligned with the Valencian AI strategy. We want to use big data and AI for policy making and for public decision making. So let's just, um, you know, let's do it. So they created this commissioner position. And basically, the commissioner positions consists of being sort of like the leader or the coordinator of a data science team that I put together. And as I said, our main goal is to assist in better decision making during the pandemic through, you know, science, data science, and sort of like scientific knowledge. And, you know, maybe one question is like, so why don't these teams exist already, right? Why is this uh, sort of like a rare, you know, effort? And the reality is that it's not easy to create such a team. And actually a team of international researchers, we actually reflected on this as a result, a little bit of this uh, thinking process, you know, that I was experiencing in early March. And we wrote this paper where we were sort of like pointing out the challenges that are involved in creating such a team. And, you know, there is capacity and awareness challenges because in the public administrations there aren't, you know, they are not super big data oriented and they don't have a lot of like, you know, data scientists and so forth. There's also challenges in terms of access to data because they don't have very modern infrastructure sometimes and, you know, they have legacy systems and it's very difficult to automate, you know, the access to the data. There are concerns about privacy and data protection, but I have to say all the work that I'm going to present is being done with 100% aggregated anonymized data, so non-personal data. So you can do a lot of interesting things with non-personal data. There is a big gap, and all of you who are scientists know about this gap between where research is and where the scientific knowledge is and where the real world is. And we're trying to close that gap, you know, but still a pretty big gap. And then in the context of a pandemic, in the same way as in the context of a natural disaster, you have to make decisions really fast. And if you don't have a, an infrastructure and a process already defined, it is very, very difficult to enable this data-driven decision making when, you know, you have to be making decisions like, you know, in, in a matter of hours. So our team became kind of like known internationally and uh, we appear in Politico and in MSNBC. So we got a certain uh, uh, not sort of like relevance, you know, in the international scene. And Basically, what we are trying to do is to fill this gap. So on the one hand, we 
has the, we have the data. We have different data sources, data of different nature. In our case, we have been working with mobile data captured by the mobile network infrastructure. We've been working with health data, but it's basically publicly available health data on the number of cases, the number of hospitalizations, and so forth. And then we've also managed to uh, handle some other types of data that we'll explain later. And then on the top, we have the policymakers and the decision makers. In our case, we are within the, our, our interaction is with the office of the president of the Valencian region. And, and the, the goal is to fill this gap. So how can we extract interesting insights and knowledge from the data, um, sort of like understanding that the data is a reflection of reality, so those, uh, that knowledge and those insights can assist you know, in, in decision making. So what we did was we created four researchers or four uh, working areas or research areas. The first one was mobile data analysis. So there is a team working on all the um, or on all that needs to be done to be able to translate this data into um, you know flows and activity and measures of you know how many people stay home with different levels of spatial granularity and also temporal granularity. Then we have another team working with ecological models and we have worked on two types of models, individual models and meta-population models. Then we have another set of people working on predictive models. And then finally, we have a very large initiative on citizen science through this very large survey called the COVID-19 Impact Survey that I'll talk about later. So even the result of all this work is still quite technical. So there's still a gap. You know, It's not really directly usable and actionable. So we're lucky that in our team, and I think this is an absolute necessity, we have one very committed, very much of an advocate member of the president's office. She's a director general, Anna Berenger. She's come to every one of our meetings, and she's been uh, working with me on interpreting the results, on uh, preparing them, uh, digesting them, figuring out what is actionable, so it can actually be useful. In terms of the technical skills, um, Everyone is a scientist and uh, uh, most of them professors from uh, the research uh, community in the Valencian region. And everyone has uh, backgrounds in computer science, statistics, machine learning, maths. Uh, but then depending on the, on the topic, there are some specific skills. For example, the mobile data team is very strong in a spatial temporal data visualization. The epidemiological team is, is a, they are, a few of them are, are mathemat mathematicians. And the modeling team are mainly statisticians and computer scientists with machine learning background. These are the members of the teams, and they are from the uh, University of Jaume I, from the Politecnico of Valencia, from the University of Alicante, from the CEU in, uh, in Elche, from the University of Miguel Hernández, from uh, FISABIO. Um, and uh, that's mainly the main, uh, so basically most of the universities and, and, and research centers that are relevant in the Valencian region. Um, the way of working has been tense. We are all volunteers. We are doing all of this in an altruistic fashion. And until around two or three weeks ago, we were meeting every day. I organized a meeting every day at 9.30. And in that meeting, we would plan the work for the day. We would brainstorm about you know, the areas, the different analyses. The Director General, Anna Berenger, came to every meeting to give us feedback on the priorities and you know, what was important or not. Um, I would produce, and I still do, a little report every day in the, in the afternoon with the main conclusions, the main results of the analysis that I share with this director general, with Anna Beringer. We have a common code repository in GitHub. Of course, everyone has signed NDAs and code of ethics and confidentiality agreements and data protection um, contracts, and we communicate using Slack. This is an example of one of the meetings. I have to say, I didn't know most of these people before, and it has been an incredible uh, experience, both in terms of uh, from a personal perspective and from a professional perspective. Everyone has worked really, really well together, but also really, really hard, and with such passion that is really inspiring, at least uh, you know to me. 
So I'll share um, some of the work that we've done in each of these areas. In the mobile data team, the main goal is to understand and quantify if the mobility changed during the confinement and what type of mobility actually changed and how much it changed and if that was enough or not. And also do that with different uh, geographic uh, sort of like granularities from uh, uh, sort of like the province, well, the whole Valencian region, then the province level, then the health department level, health zones, municipalities, and then and then some cells that I'll explain, which was the lowest level of granularity. We've used different visualization tools. This is an example of a visualization of the mobility uh, in March, uh, in, during already the confinement uh, in the Valencian region. So you can see that there is a lot of more localized sort of like mobility, but not a lot of long range mobility. And this is some of the results or the analysis that we did. So uh, the first one was in terms of the radius of gyration. So the radius, the radius of that gyration measures the radius of the circumference that covers most of the movements of a population. And in the context of the community of the Valencian region, we uh, observe a decrease in the radius of gyration of 65%, which was even higher than the average for Spain. Uh, that means that if before the confinement, the average radius was 10 kilometers, then during the confinement, it would be 3.5 kilometers. So people on average would travel 3.5 within a circumference of 3.5 kilometers radius. We also uh, did a lot of work on measuring and understanding if the stay at home campaign actually worked, if people actually were staying at home. So to do that, um, um, uh, before I do that, I'm going to explain a little bit more about the data. So uh, the Valencian region w was the, uh, a pilot community for analyzing um, some data that the, office, uh, the National Office of Statistics, so the INE, uh, had um, been generating through a partnership with the three largest telcos, Telefonica, Orange, and Vodafone. This data is right now publicly available from the INE website, but it wasn't available during the confinement. Uh, but we had access because we, we were this sort of like pilot community. Um, so um, the INE defines these um, areas, and these areas have to have at least 5,000 people to preserve privacy. And then if um, uh, a municipalities that have between 5,000 and 70,000 people, I think it is, then you have one of these cells per municipality. But then if it's larger municipalities, then they split the municipality. So, they, so Valencia, for example, will have multiple of these cells. Um, for each cell and for each day, we get an estimation on how many people stayed in the cell for the whole day, and that cell was the cell with what is called the, the cell of the residence. So this is the cell where they sleep. So that's what we call the stay at home. In reality, it's not home, it's staying in, in, this, in your particular cell where you sleep. That's one type of data. And then the other type of data that we get are how many people can, who don't sleep in this cell come into the cell during the day, and how many people uh, that is sleep in the cell, leave the cell during the day. And we only know where they come from, so which other cell they come from, or which cell they go to, if there is at least 100 people that actually went from the same cell to the same cell. Um, because of this 100 people constraint, which is to preserve privacy, there are a lot of mobility flows that are lost where we don't have the origin or the destination. But we also have the overall, the total, and that one is, that one is uh, accurate. It's because we don't know where they're coming from. So for the purpose of the stay at home campaign, um, on average, 80, uh, on working days, 88% of the population and on weekends, 92% of the population did not leave their area of residence. Um, uh, during the day. So it was actually, there was a lot of confinement. Um, we made a website uh, with all of this that you can play with. It's active and you can go all the way to June and then you can see for every municipality um, a, how many people stay, how many people go. You can change the time period. Um, you can um, see the differences with a baseline day in November. So it's a pretty nice visualization of all the work that we did on analyzing the mobility. This is an example of how um, the stay-at-home 
So for the percentage of people who stayed on their cell of residence, how it changed over time. So the, the more yellow there is on the map, the lower the percentage of people that stayed in their um, cell of in their area of residence. So March 16th was the first day of confinement, where the first day that we didn't have schools and there was a recommendation for uh, teleworking. And you see there is a lot of yellow still. Then as the confinement progressed, and particularly the first two weeks of April when there was no labor mobility, there are very, a lot of like, uh, most of it is green, which means it's like around in the 90s of uh, uh, the percentage of people that didn't leave their area of residence. And then as the confinement measures have been lifting, then, you know, we can see more yellow. We've also done the analysis at the Department of Health um, level because that's the level that is uh, useful and meaningful from the perspective of making um, public health you know decisions because these cells are pretty big we call it a stay at home but it's, it's a very big home because in many cases it's like the whole village uh, or even you know multiple villages in the villages are small so we also deployed a very large citizen survey as i explained it's called the COVID 19 impact survey and one of the questions in the survey was asking people, for which activities did you leave your home during the, the last week? And one of the activities was, or one of the answers was, I did not leave my home at all. And that is really my home. It's not my area of residence, but my actual building, you know, my house. And during the confinement, we found that around 10% of the participants reported not leaving their home. We also analyzed the labor mobility and we analyzed it both using the survey data and the mobile data. So on the survey, we asked people if they worked um, last month or not. So if they were actually working or they were unemployed or they were students. And then for the ones that worked, we asked them if they went to work physically, if they worked from home or if they didn't work. And what we found was that roughly um, at the beginning, um, uh, of the confinement and during the the part where there was no labor mobility, there was around 30 something percent of people who teleworked. And that percentage has gone down a lot uh, now, for example, I think it's around 18 percent uh, of people who report that they are uh, teleworking. In terms of the mobile data, we looked at the percentages of people that during the day were not on their area of residence. So they had moved to some other area during the day and we compare that to a baseline day that they share with us from November and what we see here is the difference in, in percentage between how many people they were outside of their area of residence on a daily on a working normal day in November versus during the confinement and what we find that is on average the, on average there were 60% uh, uh, less people outside of their area of residence during working hours than in November so it was a big drop we built a lot of visualizations of these activity levels um, and you can, when we can see the evolution over time. So this was the wake of March 24th. There was a still labor mobility and we see the greener, the bigger the drop. We see that there are areas that there was a drop in the uh, labor mobility, but it wasn't that large. It was around 20% less than in November. Then when we go to the first week of April, which is when there was no labor mobility, then everything became really green. Like there was, it was really, there was almost no labor mobility. We did the same study for all the departments of health to um, understand how connected were between them because we are building epidemiological models at the department of health level. So it's very important to understand if there is mobility between them. In fact, we used uh, the mobility data to build a graph and we ran a community detection algorithm on this graph to identify self-contained communities, communities that will have a lot of inner mobility, but not a lot of mobility between them. And some interesting observation is that we found communities that were going across uh, provinces, for example, the north of Valencia and the south of Castellón, even across uh, autonomous regions. For example, the north of Castellón is actually quite connected to the south of Tarragona. Um, and um, by uh, identifying which, one were, which ones were the most self-contained of these communities, we identified 14 what we call macro zones, which are zones that have a fair 
uh, or a quite significant percentage of internal mobility, and they don't have a lot of cross mobility. Uh, so they can be modeled as sort of like autonomous uh, entities from a mobility perspective. We also analyze the tourism mobility because uh, tourism is very important in the Valencian region. We did this at the very beginning of the confinement because then there was no tourists anymore. And we did find a significant drop in the uh, presence of uh, mobile phones that were not from uh, the autonomous region of Valencia. For example, in Benidorm, uh, there was a drop of like 53% like the first day of the confinement. The second area is epidemiological models. And the output of the mobile data analysis is also the input to the epidemiological models because we want the models to take into account the mobility. And main questions that we're trying to answer are how many cases there will be not only based on the current situation but also be able to do different scenarios and be able to understand what's the impact of different public policies or different behaviors from people and of course the question you know are the contention measures enough you know or sh should we do more because we're st we we're going to have so many cases that there will be a collapse of the medical system we have been working with um, two types of models. The first one is a SAIR metapopulation model, which probably you are familiar with. A population is divided into different states, and then there are certain sort of like probabilities that determine the transition from one state to the next. In the case of COVID-19, because in principle, no one uh, was immunized against COVID-19 in February, we assume that the entire population of the Valencian region is susceptible. And then as you have the first cases, those cases are infected people, and then you inject them into the system. And then um, these different parameters regulate the probability that a susceptible individual will be exposed to the disease, then an exposed individual will actually develop the disease, and then a person who develops the disease will actually recover. So all these parameters are defined for COVID-19 right now, and we used the um, the values reported in the literature. These are the different equations to update um, the, the different populations uh, over time. And we basically tuned this model to the Valencian region, to each province, and also to each department of health. So we had one model for the entire region, one for each province, and then one for, actually, I don't think we have one for each province anymore. I think we just have one for each department of health. So we have 24 say models. This is an example of like fitting some of the models. Um, the blue line is the number of reported cases, and then the orange line is the estimation by the model. Um, taking into account that this is not the underlying number of infected in the model, because there are a lot of undetected infected people, either because they are asymptomatic because they have very light symptoms or even because there, are, they are, there weren't enough tests at the beginning of the pandemic. So what we also did and we will still do is we automatically uh, uh, compute what we call the percentage of detection. So there is an underlying population that is infected, but only 10% of the infected are detected, you know, or whatever it is. So this graph here shows our estimation of how many detected they would be in orange versus how many reported cases there will be, and it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good fit. We've also been working with um, uh, adaptation of the uh, REINA agent base, uh, uh, so sort of like individual modeling, epidemiological model, and we fitted the model to the Valencian region, and we've been running both models in parallel every day uh, to generate uh, predictions uh, of the number of cases, hospitalized, uh, intensive care units, and so forth. One of the simulations that we did was running different scenarios of the models um, from doing nothing to having only social distancing, closing schools, teleworking, blah, 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 until what we did. And then as of May 6th, the model was estimating around 13,000 cases, 1,200 deaths and 7,500 recover. And then if we had that nothing, you know, the figures are much, much larger. The third uh, area is an area that is uh, mainly working on 
um, building risk, risk maps and building uh, prediction models of the intensive care units that are not based on the epidemiological model, but that are based on um, a, sort of like a time series, uh, machine learning sort of like types of models. Right now we are working on an early warning system. Um, so how early can we um, detect uh, changes in the situation? So we can actually issue some kind of warning, you know, that the, the situation seems to be deteriorating. And also, uh, we're working on developing risk maps, maps that would combine all the different analyses that we do to assess the probability that a Department of Health will actually surpass its intensive care capacity. And the last area is uh, what we call citizen science. And the main project there is the COVID-19 impact survey, which I encourage you to participate if you haven't, and you can actually do it every week, and it's fully anonymous. So the reason why we launched this survey was because very early on, we realized that there were very important questions that we couldn't really answer with the data that we had. For example, how were people getting infected during the confinement? What was their social contact behavior? What was the actual economic and labor impact of the confinement? What was the interplay between the labor and the economic impact and the resilience of the population, for example, towards the confinement? What was the prevalence of symptoms? Were there tests? Were there enough tests? You know, what was the emotional impact of the confinement in people's lives? So we launched this survey to try to shed light on these questions. We worked really hard in, on defining the shortest possible survey that would enable us to answer these questions in the shortest amount of time. So we would actually get a lot of answers. So after a lot of work, we came up with 24 questions, which then later we added one and ended up being 25 questions. And it has been with 25 questions for a long time. The survey uh, was launched on March 28th and uh, it's still going. So you can answer it. And as I said, ideally, you answer it every week. Initially, we launched it in Spanish and in English, but then it became quite popular. And now we have it in all these different languages. And actually, here there's one, um, well, I guess it's Portuguese. So we have a, big, uh, a bigger effort in Brazil in collaboration with one University of Brazil. And we have around, I think it's 9,000 or so answers from Brazil. Uh, the survey became viral. Uh, just uh, basically a few hours after we launched it, and we managed to collect over 140,000 answers in less than two days. That was really incredible and unexpected at the same time. Um, uh, we felt really emotional seeing the solidarity of people and the generosity of people. Mayors from towns share the survey with their people, uh, NGOs, associations, um, of course, you know, Twitter and WhatsApp. So people were sharing it with each other and, 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 and saying, oh, you can help, you know, understand the answers to these questions. So we felt a lot of responsibility in sharing the results of the survey. So we worked really hard on preparing a paper and we wrote a paper just a couple of days later where we shared the first results and the conclusions. The paper is online, you can look at it. And then we also built this website is here, COVID-19impactsurvey.org results. And you can see the raw results uh, for not only for Spain, also for other countries uh, and all the different categories in, in the answers. And it's quite nice and it's a very rich data set. We got a lot of very interesting um, insights from the survey that I won't go in, into detail, but you can read the paper. But I just wanted to share with you some of the more surprising uh, results. A surprising results that we got was regarding the role of social interactions. We found that around 80% of the people who reported having been positive with COVID-19 also reported having had close contact with someone that they knew and that was also positive from COVID-19. So the likely source of infection for a very high percentage of people seemed to be known. Of course, this was during a period of confinement, but that was a very surprising finding to us that there was a, such a, you know, that it was such a high percentage of people who, who had a suspicion as to who might have infected them. 
In terms of the emotional impact, one of the most surprising findings was the impact that the confinement has had on the really young people. This is the question where we ask about emotional impact. We say, in your home, have you noticed a significant increase in any of these areas that you would consider damaging? And the areas are overuse of medicine and drugs, overuse of alcohol, arguments or fights, loneliness, sadness, stress, anxiety, excessive use of technology in kids, and excessive use of technology in adults. And here we have the different age brackets. So the first observation is that the arguments in the home, the stress, the anxiety, the sadness, but even the loneliness are at the highest among the young people. The second worrying observation is the excessive use of technology by children in the population that is that is in the age range, you know, uh, corresponding to having children, small children at home. So that's definitely an area of concern. We've also analyzed the resilience of the population towards the measures over time. There is one question where we ask, for how long do you think you could continue being in confinement? And the options are zero days. One week, two weeks, one month, three months, or six months. So the first surprising finding for us was that the most popular answer was one month. As you can see here, it was around 44% of the population or so. But even a month later, it was still one month. <laughs> so it seemed that for a long time, almost for two months, I think the most popular answer was one month. Right now, the situation has changed. But it's been going down over time. And now it's much lower, actually. At the same time, the percentage of people who said that they would have low resilience that would like only be able to last, say, for zero days or one week was very, very low at the beginning. And it has been growing steadily over time. More interestingly, um, we also found a very significant gender difference between the people who said that they could last six months where almost like it was twice as popular for men than for females. So the males seem to be able to stay in confinement a lot more time you know, than the women. We also ask about what the percentage, the perception of the measures by the people in terms of whether they thought the measures were enough, were too much, or they think that the government should do more. And um, the most popular answer at the beginning was do more. And then as the weeks have gone by, people um, think that this is too much or you know, there's already been done enough. Um, we also looked into which ones were the key factors that impacted resilience. And we found that economic impact, severe economic impact, like not being able to pay the mortgage or not being, not being able to buy food, emotional impact, particularly sadness, anxiety, and stress, and then young age, are the key factors that multiply by a lot the probability for people to say that they can't take it anymore. <coughs> we also looked at the, um, the factors that influence um, people thinking that the measures were too much. And again, we find economic impact and emotional impact. But now, instead of having a, an age a factor, we have a gender factor, where males are more likely than females to say that the measures were too much. We look at the economic impact per profession, and we find that hospitality was the most affected profession, which is actually one of the a very important profession in the Valencian region, uh, together with construction and commercial services. As I said, um, uh, we are working on the risk maps and on other projects right now, but I wanted to share with you some work that we did in April uh, in terms of herd immunity. So, in uh, the Valencian region, we reached the peak of infections on April 6th. And one question that we asked ourselves very quickly afterwards was, is there going to be a second wave? Is there going to be a situation of herd immunity or not? Herd immunity means that a very large percentage of the population, say 65% or 70% of the population, is already immune to a certain virus in this case. And therefore, there is no chance to have a pandemic because so many people are already immune that the virus cannot really spread you know, and grow exponentially. Um, so the question was, given that there were so many undetected cases and so many asymptomatic people, is there a situation of herd immunity or not you know, in, in the case of COVID-19? And uh, so we tried to answer that question. Of course, 
the scientifically uh, sort of like proven way to answer that question is by doing a seroprevalence study and taking you know doing a blood test on the entire population ideally but otherwise a representative sample and then detecting whether they have antibodies or not for the virus of interest in this case COVID-19 this results the seroprevalence study hadn't even started at that time so we did it using other methods so the first method that we did was we built a model based on the answers from the survey because we ask about symptoms and we also know whether people reported being positive or not from coronavirus and by doing that we obtained a prevalence of around two percent in the valencian region which was very aligned with the results of the seroprevalence study Another method that we used was uh, from the perspective of, of the deaths. How many infected people do you need to have to explain the deaths that you observe? And we applied two different methods. And with the first method, our estimation was between 1.5% and 4%. And then in the second method, we go between 1% and 3% with the average value of 2.37, which was very aligned with the results of the seroprevalence study. And then the last method was using our metapopulation epidemiological model. The model, as I said, has a lot more of infected people that actually are reported. So we can compute this ratio and see how many really infected people there were. And according to our model, there will be around 2.3% of the population. So the answer in any case was no. We're actually really far away from herd immunity. Um, so given that um, this is the case, we also did actually some other simulations on percentage of people immunized and also what happens if we lift the contention measures and we don't do anything else differently. And of course, if you didn't do anything else differently, meaning the world was exactly the same as it was in February, which is not the case, then the models like explode and <laughs> it's a big second wave. So luckily we are not exactly like we were you know, in February. Um, a lot of the focus also right now has been on um, the early detection of the positive cases to detect them, to isolate them, and that way prevent the spread and what is called community transmission, the spread of the disease. So for that, there are three key infrastructures that need to be in place, contact tracing, testing, and quarantine. So to help with this, we change one question in the survey and we um, asked the new question that we introduced was asking people to estimate how many close contacts they had in one week outside of their household. We're trying to see, first of all, if the number of close contacts is increasing as people are becoming more social and as we are lifting the contention measures. But also we wanted to, to sort of like figure out what was the, the order of magnitude in the number of contacts to better dimension the contact tracing teams. So we introduced a question uh, the, 20, the week of the 22nd of May. And then at the beginning that week, 31% uh, of the participants reported having zero contacts in the week from outside of the household, zero close contacts. And this percentage has been going down over time. And then the percentage of people that um, report estimating having had between 10 and 19 close contacts in a week has actually gone up a lot. And the distribution also has sort of like become more like sort of like kind of like flatter around up to like uh, nine contact, nine close contacts. And then we have this sort of like long tail of around three, four percent that have a lot of contacts. So looking at this, you would imagine that a special measure should be taken for these people because they seem to be you know, very social. So we looked at the professions, and we found that there are certain professions that have a much larger likelihood than others to report had a lot of close contacts in a week, particularly essential services, health and social, commercial, and actually public administration. So I think it would, be, it would make sense to adopt special measures in these professions, because they are the most likely to be uh, um, spreading, potentially, the virus to a lot of people. 
Using the individual agent-based epidemiological model, we've also run simulations of the impact of contact tracing from doing 0% of contact tracing to doing 100% of contact tracing. And it's quite interesting because we find, keeping all the other parameters the same, that even just doing 40 or 50% of contact tracing, so detecting 40 or 50 percent of the close contacts of, of an infected individual and actually flatten the second wave a lot. And then finally, we are working on this patient funnel, and particularly, we are very interested in this early warning system because we don't have a lot of time to react if we are all the way down here when we realize that things are becoming bad. So for early warning, we are using the answers to the survey. We are also using uh, a Google, uh, like the trends, the Google Trends results, and we are hoping to use Twitter and Facebook, but this is very early work right now. And this is just an example of the decisions that we make every week on the prevalence based on the answers uh, to the survey. And right now, everything seems pretty flat, but we keep an eye in case we see that some of the trends are going up. So just to wrap up, I hope that I have shared with you a little bit of the flavor of this uh, experience where experts, but also citizens, we are working together with, you know, uh, sort of like public uh, policy makers to contribute to evidence-driven public policy making and it's been a really um, enriching and a very positive and inspiring experience for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much Nuria for your very interesting, very interesting talk. Now we have questions. Uh, I can read uh, this one, this very long, in fact it's a number of questions by Jaime. Uh, he's asking for instance how does Google Open Mobility data compares to cell phone data? Uh, sorry, how was, sorry? How, how does Which Google thing? Open Mobility Data compares to cell phone data? Yeah, so, um, so basically the data captured by the mobile network infrastructure, particularly the collaboration with the INE, with the National Office of Statistics, is the most representative sample possible in terms of whatever they measure because is the data from the three largest mobile operators and then the Office of Statistics actually extrapolates mm -hmm. that data to the entire Spanish population. So in terms of biases, it's the least biased data. The, the, the issue is the data itself is quite limited because um, the original reason why the INE had a collaboration with the three telcos was not because of COVID-19. It was a former collaboration that they had where they were exploring the value that this data had to help the INE make more accurate and more sort of like up-to-date uh, sen uh, census about um, labor mobility. The, the traditional way to mm -hmm. estimate labor mobility is by doing surveys and that is very expensive and it doesn't really scale. So they were hoping to see if by using the data from the operators, um, they could have a better assessment of labor mobility. And that's why, as I explained, the data that we have is very, very much targeted, targeted to labor mobility. We have, for each of these regions, we just have, you know, let, I'll tell you the detail, let me tell you the whole detail. So the detail is, um, Every day, so it's aggregated in a day, um, for they determine what is the cell where people sleep, and then they look at the people that spend at least two hours in a different cell from the one where they sleep, and they pick the cell where they spend the most time greater than two hours. And the main idea is if you work, if you live here, but you work in this other cell, then um, you will probably spend the most time in the place where you work. So we're only going to look at the cell where you spend the most time. Meaning, if I live here and I spend two hours, I spend say two and a half hours here, and then I spend three hours here, and then I spend five hours here before I go home, I would only they will only record this one because they will think that's the one where you work. So it's it was very targeted to this labor mobility measure. So having said so is a very representative sample because it covers the entire population whereas google data or facebook data 
it has a bias because you have to be a Google user or a Facebook user. And of course, you know, not everyone, um, you know, maybe has an Android phone or not everyone uses Facebook. So there is a certain bias, you know, in the sample. So I think there are trade-offs. The Google and the Facebook data is way, I mean, they is way more accurate geographically. I mean, it's GPS. Um, this data is not. We are talking about these cells. This data is sort of like very aggregated, especially and, and also temporally, is every day. But um, at the same time, because of combining the data from the three operators and the National Office of Statistics extrapolating and, and they know how to extrapolate, I think it's a representative sample for whatever variables you know they are measuring. Yeah. And I think, and that's one of the reasons why we want to also leverage um, uh, data from other data sources to be able to answer other questions like Google data or, or Twitter data, for example, or even Facebook data, yeah. It's a question by Manlio yeah. at the end. So we are still learning about the role played by asymptomatic, how you are taking into account for this uh, while using the SEIR. Yeah. Yeah, so so the way we're taking that into account is by what I explained between the gap between the infected and the reported. So we estimate that difference every day, and that difference accounts for asymptomatic, lightly symptomatic, and people who is just not tested. There are many reasons why people are not accounted for, right? And then the second one, we were talking about this earlier, actually, is like, how do we take into, a fa in, uh, into account a human behavior of factors, like people wearing masks or people, um, you know, a sort of like awareness. Um, so in the, so we, we have another piece of work that I didn't explain where we automatically estimate the transmission rate and we are decomposing that transmission rate into two factors, the mobility factor and the human behavior factor. And we don't know um, the de we don't have the details of saying human behavior because of social distancing versus wearing masks versus something else. But we think, okay, um, those two factors are important because with the same level of mobility, we are not observing the same um, transmission rate. So there's definitely a role that the human factors are playing. This is in the same model. And then in the agent-based model, the agent-based models are very, very detailed. You can actually detail the behavior of each of the agents. And there's one agent for each citizen. But the problem is they're very, very complex, both computationally, but also uh, to get them to work. Because they have so many parameters that then they have to actually explain reality. So you need to fit the model to the real data, right? So we have a little bit of a social behavior in the agent-based model, but it's a very simple, um, uh, we have a contact, um, actually, a matrix by um, age group in the model, but it's the same. We, we, we are not changing it um, uh, over time. So that's another area of work. You know, that's a, a, a good question that, um, that you're asking. So is, there's a lot of unknowns still um, that make this very hard. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to have a model that fits the data really, really well, like every day, because there are issues in terms, even in terms of the testing protocols and how the cases, you know, are being sort of like computer. And that's why we prefer to have an underlying number of cases that our model thinks that there are, and then we just adjust the detection rate because the detection rate is what is really changing. It's not the real number of cases. It's just that they're being measured in a different way depending on whether you're counting PCRs or you're counting PCRs plus fast tests or you know how you are counting the cases. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that I didn't talk about, but I think this is an interesting result, is uh, when I said that there are three big pillars for the second wave, which is contact tracing, testing, and quarantine. I didn't explain this, but it's a very important piece. According to our survey, 40% um, of the participants in the survey report not being able to put themselves in quarantine. So if you identify the contacts of a positive case, and then you tell them, OK, you need to put yourself in quarantine because that's the way to break the, 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 the chain of infection. And 40% of them, they are not going to be able to put themselves in quarantine. You have a problem. 
So we need to figure out how to help these people to actually self-isolate. And the reasons are, the number one is because they share the home with other people and they cannot move outside of their home. Or because they have to take care of people. They have to take care of their children or they have to take care of elderly. Then the second set of reasons are economic reasons. People not being able to afford economically being two weeks out of work or people not being able to take a medical leave or even people fearing that they will lose their job if they take a medical leave. So we need to fix that. And then the third set of reasons are psychological reasons, mainly people telling us that they, don't, they cannot see themselves confined for two more weeks or fear of stigmatization by their community. So I think this is a very important element because we are coming from the assumption that every positive case and every suspicious case will be able to isolate themselves for two weeks. And our, our, our work is showing that a lot of them won't. Uh, and, and that's why I think it's important is to uh, slow down or at least flatten a little bit more like the second wave. Yeah. Okay, Nuria. Can you hear me, Nuria? So no? social bias in the, in the survey. So we actually know, we, we reweighted all the data. So we took the uh, statistics data from the INE in terms of gender, age, province, and professions, and we reweighted all the data to make it match the distribution of our survey to match the distribution of the Spanish population. So in the paper, that is the preprint that you can access, all the results are reweighted and extrapolated to the population. On the website that I showed, the results are not reweighted, it's the raw data, so it is not the Spanish population, it's the respondents of the survey. So when you look at the uh, demographic distribution of the answers, you will see that there are more women than men, for example, so there's a gender bias, but we correct for that on the paper uh, and, on, and in the um, uh, sort of like conclusions derived from the work. Having said so, the sample is so large that actually the differences between weighting and reweighting were actually minimal, but we reweighted everything um, for the paper, but that's a, a, a good question. Um, well, any other questions? Uh, there was oh, there was a question by uh, Carmen that was uh, I love the idea of scientists making an effort to get I closer am. to decision maker without. But what is your impression about their appreciation of your work? So um, working so close. I, uh, so, yeah, so I, I I think they appreciate it a lot. Actually, they want the work to continue, but one of the challenges is how sustainable it is working so hard, so many people, uh, sort of like completely for free. It's not very sustainable over time because people have to eat, you know, and the scientists also have to eat. And so they are trying to figure out a more sustainable way. Um, I think one of the key um, elements for the success of initiatives like this one is to have a very committed, very passionate, at least one person on the government side. Someone that really believes in this, that is really committed to this, and that really understands the value of it. And we were lucky to have that because this Director General, Anna Berenguer, is, as I said, she came to every meeting. Having someone from the government to come to every daily meeting in the team, but it wasn't just the meeting. It was like I had many meetings with her every day for a long time, hours, talking about you know what can we do and this and that. So I think that was one of the key elements. And then the mm -hmm. other one um, was I'm really amazed by the team. I mean the team is amazing. The people are incredible. I think we should feel very proud of the talent that we have in Spain. And, um, and 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 also the the passion and the commitment. You know, we work we work weekends, we work over Easter. You know, we work on holidays, uh, and everyone was really excited about this. And I think that's something really, you know, to appreciate. Yeah. Okay, Nuria. Uh, now I have a question myself. What is going to happen next? What yeah. Is going so. To happen when of these confinement measurements and people take again the plane and travels and everything. Yeah, so I am worried um, 
particularly in terms of the tourism, I am worried. Um, this, um, uh, you know, epidemiology, sort of like pandemics are pandemics only and exclusively because people make them pandemics. I mean, there's, the disease doesn't spread if we don't spread it, right? So, and the end, so the, the number of people in the population plays an important role. And here in Spain, the N can be two N in the summer. I mean, we receive a lot of people here in the summer, right? So for me, it is definitely a big worry. I am giving tomorrow a talk in the Reconstruction Commission from the in the Valencian Parliament, uh, and and I, I mentioned that in my talk. I I I think we need a really strong multidisciplinary team of experts. Uh, hopefully there is already because it's a little bit late right now, but uh, working really hard on, on the challenge of the tourism because on the one hand, the tourism is important for our economy, but on the other hand, we cannot afford a second confinement. That's another message that I say, I don't think we can afford a second confinement. I don't think we can afford it psychologically, and I don't think you can, we can afford it economically, financially. I think it would be devastating mm -hmm. to have a second confinement. So my view is we need to avoid a second confinement. And we know that with high likelihood there's gonna be a second wave. So the the focus for me would be how do we minimize the impact of the second wave? Because the confinement strategy should not be what we have in mind as the way to minimize the second wave. I think we need to do everything possible to avoid having to do a second confinement. And that's why I put so much emphasis on contact tracing, on testing, mm -hmm on quarantine and also on special measures for special populations. You know, I think we need to be very, very rigorous with nursing homes. We have to be very rigorous in hospitals and we have to um, be extremely protective of healthcare personnel and essential services personnel. And then as I said, we know already there's called the three C's in English, which is indoor environments, so closed indoor environments, where there is a lot of people that are having close contact um, and um, sustained close contact, like, uh, I don't know, like an office where everyone is working there, you know, and it has no ventilation, it has no windows, or meat processing plants, or food processing plants, or factories. So if we know this, I think we should take a special measures in those places, because those places tend to be places for outbreaks, right? So if we know it, let's do something before, you know, there is an outbreak. And I was just mentioning before we started that there is this new um, cool technique now where you can do pool testing to make it cheaper, mm -hmm. which means you could, you could um, do a PCR taking samples, say, of 20 people. And then if the result is negative, no one has it. If the result is positive, one of, one of the 20 at least has it. You don't know whom. So then you need to test the 20. But at least it's a way to screen in a much more like cheaper way, right? And, and, and maybe we need to do stuff like that, you know, in factories, in nursing homes, um, to minimize the probability for, um, for outbreaks. And then the other important issue is, we know that the impact of the disease is very different depending on your risk factor and on your age. So if we are able to have measures that protect the people at risk, um, the fact that, you know, a lot of young people get it, statistically the impact should be minimal. They wouldn't need to go to the hospital. They, they wouldn't need to be in intensive care. All they need to do is isolate themselves to avoid you know, infecting other people. So um, I think that's fine. The goal is not to um, uh, uh, surpass the capacity of the healthcare system and of course avoid you know, unnecessary deaths. But for young people, usually the disease doesn't give any complications if you don't have any risk factors, at least for now, all the data that we have. Yeah. Oh. Okay, I see. So Alvaro Corral is, is asking, uh, so we cannot afford a second confinement in October, November? So your opinion is that we cannot afford a second confinement, right? Personally, I think that neither financially nor psychologically. I mean, things could change psychologically in October. Maybe in October, people are in a different mind, mind frame than now. Right now, according to the survey, um, the percentage of people that, uh, that report not being able to be confined anymore has gone up a lot and particularly among the young people i think mm -hmm. if i have to say something i think children and young people have been the forgotten ones during this mm -hmm. pandemic 
and um, and I think the young people are really suffering a lot. Um, we see this from the stress, from the anxiety, from the loneliness, or even the sadness. You know, you would think, wow, the young people, they are so connected. You know, they're always on their phones. They must be hyper connected. How can they feel lonely, right? And it turns out that they report really high levels of loneliness. Um, so, so I do worry about this, and that's why I think a second confinement should be like the last resort, really. I mean, we know what is happening right now in, in Beijing. You know, they are doing a second confinement. Uh, uh, you know, a number of places, Korea is like super uh, ultra controlling of what is, you know, of what is going on. Um, I, de I, I mean, I know it's very, very hard, but ideally we don't get to that point. Okay, so maybe we now take the last question by Enrique. Uh, he's saying that maybe there is some mismatch between GPS data and uh, other measures of mobility uh, indicated by INE. And uh, he's asking uh, these this issues regarding tracking with phones without GPS uh, that put a lot of uh, doubt on short distances, if this problem can propagate until the kilometer scale. Okay, so I think the reason why the uh, the Apple um, uh, and the uh, I think uh, Google or Facebook mobility data that uh, indicate confinements around 70%. I think it depends on the spatial granularity that we use. As I said, uh, yeah. in the in a, the area of residence is pretty big, so movements in the area of residence are not taken into account. So um, if the area of residence is pretty big and I move a lot inside my area of residence, but it's invisible to that particular type of data, right? Um, whereas that's not invisible to the GPS. And I think that's why, as I explained, I, we are complement, complementing it both with answers from the survey and also uh, we have to understand that concept that our spatial resolution with the inner data is these cells that they define, these areas, right? Um, any movement inside the area is invisible, whereas for a GPS uh, chip, that is not invisible. Uh, you see those movements inside the area, and I think that's why, it, so it depends on how you define confinement, basically. Okay, so Nuria, thank you so much for your very nice talk. Uh, we know that you are very busy these days, that this pandemic is keeping you very busy, so we really appreciate yeah. all your time and your your this talk that you shared with us. So thank you so much. Pleasure. Nuria. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for all the questions. Okay. I love them. Thank you. Thank so, you very much, Nuria. So you are uh, very appreciate that uh, you, you know your, your time is very, uh, <laughs> very very difficult to get and uh, of course you are uh, tomorrow you have an uh, important. Uh, so to yeah, to I have to prepare your... my speech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. but, but you will, but you will succeed on it. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, so my, thanks. my only, my only petition again, if you can please, if you can answer yeah. the survey, I would yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> okay, okay, we will. Put, uh, uh, okay, thank you so thank much. You. Uh, let, thank let you. Thank you, everyone. Let me just, okay, let me. Ciao. Thank, thanks a lot. Let me just uh, remember, uh, remind all of you that are uh, still around that uh, we will have more, uh, more uh, webinars yet uh, to come. Uh, let me see if I can share. Uh, I can see that. Uh, okay, for instance. Here we are. So remember that uh, we have we have more webinars uh, next week. We have by Santiago Elena ma mainly from this uh, virus uh, analysis. Next, uh, Alex uh, about epidemics and mobility. And at the end, so this is just a pleasure to announce that we have a new contribution, another contribution to our webinar cycles by Ernesto Estrada. It's uh, talking about fractional diffusion, whatever it is about the human proteome as an alternate explanation for multi agent So please uh, keep. Uh, updated and uh, keep online and we will be it will be a pleasure to share all this uh, all this with you so you are welcome for the next uh, weeks uh, okay Maria Angeles uh, okay I'm missing you uh, well uh, okay uh, we are having so many problems today but uh, okay so people we we are done Yes, I think so. Oh, okay. I think. Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Okay. Hope to see you back. Bye bye.